Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. Brandis Friedman is on assignment. On the show tonight, student loan forgiveness may soon be on the horizon. A look at what could be in the Biden administration's plan. After promises to fix the gang database, WTTW News finds CPD has yet to launch a new system. We dig into why. There are days as governor when I'm not sure I have the words. A leak from the Supreme Court could signal the end of Roe versus Wade. Our Spotlight Politics team assesses the impact. There's a question about the review process even being a legitimate review process. Illinois bands together with other states and environmentalists who want the Postal Service to electrify its fleet of delivery trucks. The fate of two early skyscrapers on State Street is at issue in a debate pitting historical preservation against security concerns. I'm Amanda Vinicky. Coming up, a look at an effort to get more women in the trades. And renovating a historic theater inside the Fine Arts Building, a home for artists for more than a century. But first off, today's top stories. The Federal Reserve is escalating its response to the country's worst inflation in 40 years. The Fed announces it is raising interest rates by half a percentage point or from 0.75 percent to 1 percent. That's the highest hike in rates in more than two decades. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell addressed the hike earlier today. Inflation is much too high and we understand the hardship it is causing and we're moving expeditiously to bring it back down. We have both the tools we need and the resolve that it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. The bank listed Russia's invasion of Ukraine as one of the factors worsening inflation pressures. And we'll have more on the impact of the interest rate hike on tomorrow's program. In an effort to address the digital divide, city officials are launching the Chicago Digital Equity Council. As many as 20 percent of Chicago households are without Internet and over 12 percent don't have computers. That's according to the mayor's office. Communities with the lowest connectivity rates are over 90 percent black on average. Over the next six months, the council will hold a series of community conversations to talk about barriers and solutions to achieving digital equity. South suburban residents are getting an upgrade to a local metro station. Officials broke ground at the 147th Sibley Boulevard station in Harvey for a rehab that's set to include elevator access, bicycle parking, and new shelters. Governor J.B. Pritzker was at today's groundbreaking. After more than 30 years without any major upgrades, the 147th Street Sibley metro station is ripe for an overhaul to keep up with the community's evolving needs. The project is estimated to cost $20 million, with some funding coming from the state's Rebuild Illinois program. Metro says the station will close May 16th for about 12 to 15 months while the project is completed. And up next, the argument for and against student loan forgiveness. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. The Biden administration has floated vague proposals to eliminate billions in collective student debt. It could set a limit of anywhere between ten and fifty thousand dollars and apply only to non-wealthy earners. Those details have yet to be ironed out, but not everyone is on board with the idea to begin with. And joining us with more are Michael Petrilli, president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, and Horacio Mendez, president and CEO of the Woodstock Institute. Thank you both for being here. Michael Petrilli, we don't know the specific of what the president is thinking, but it could be anywhere from canceling ten to fifty thousand dollars of student debt. Good idea. It's not a good idea. You know, some kind of targeted relief would be a good idea. Targeted relief, perhaps, for the poorest uh, Americans out there who have student loan debt, or for people who were taken advantage of by some of those for-profit universities, the Trump universities of the world. Or maybe people who choose to go into public service, uh, jobs like teaching that don't pay very well. All of those would be legitimate ways uh, to deal with some of the debt crisis. Uh, but doing it across the board means giving, you know, the 23-year-old kid who's off to Wall Street 
uh, $10,000 that he doesn't need. And uh, it would cost a lot of money. It could definitely contribute to rising inflation right now. And it just doesn't problem that we have at hand. Certainly uh, could lead to the deficit. What about that, Horacio Mendez, a more targeted approach versus across the board? Yeah, I don't disagree with what was just said. Uh, keep in mind that over 50% of outstanding student debt belongs to the top 40% of the income ladder. Um, you know, the bottom 20% of the income ladder represents less than 14% of outstanding debt and 20% of all student loan borrowers have less than 5,000 in debt. So the $10,000 figure seems like a good in-between number to capture those individuals as well as graduates of four-year programs. But the $125,000 income threshold leans a bit too much towards a system where a lot of the money might go to successful affluent white students. Now keep in mind, $125,000 means very different things in different markets. I recently moved to the Chicago area from Northern California and 125 k a year gets you a rented Sears tool shed in the backyard of someone's house in Oakland. It means something very different in Manuka, Illinois. So we need context, and I think being a little bit more specific and targeted is going to make better sense. At the same time, Michael Petrilli, you know, there are many surveys that say folks with student debt uh, overwhelmingly put off life decisions like home purchases, marriage, kids, saving for retirement. So could some kind of relief actually have a benefit? Well, I understand that argument, and it may have made sense a year or two or three ago, of course, before this terrible pandemic that we've all been through. But we've now gone through this period where we've given virtually all Americans repeatedly uh, checks from the federal government as part of the relief acts. Uh, and now we have a situation where the labor market's super tight and we have sky high inflation. And so the worry is if it, this is the time when you write another $10,000 check to millions of Americans, that's going to drive inflation up, and it may not actually end up in the hands of the people who need it most. If, if the goal is to help people who are struggling to start their, their life, there's a hundred better ways to do it than to just, you know, give out student loan debt willy-nilly. You know, we could invest in uh, child tax credits. It makes it less expensive to raise a child. You know, we could do work to try to make housing more affordable. Uh, there's a laundry list of that. Uh, debt forgiveness doesn't come anywhere near the top of that list, in my opinion. And and frankly, uh, you know, it's hard to find experts on either the left or right that think that giving student debt forgiveness to everybody to say that that makes any sense. Horacio Mendez, you were talking about that potential $125,000 income threshold. The president still hasn't really decided on that yet. And you talk about the different uh, cost of living situations in different areas. So what would be a more appropriate income threshold to really weed out the folks uh, that can afford to pay their debt back? Well, and I'm not necessarily sure whether or not income ends up being the be all and end all of this issue. Uh, we want to make sure this kind of relief goes to the people who are working hard and making the best way that they can, uh, but struggling to make their student loan payments versus someone in the basement of their parents' mansion playing Fortnite needing Hot Pockets. So it's $10,000 the right amount is where we begin, and there's always context to numbers. So the only rational solution is to make the numbers relevant to the context. For example, you got hosed by a for-profit school that saddled you with $35,000 in debt for a program you had to drop out of and are trying to dig yourself out with three jobs. Yeah, you're okay, we'll help you. You're a techie creating yet another cocktail delivery app and have 10 grand left in your MBA loan. Now, I think for the most part, you're gonna do okay on your own. Uh, there are a variety of different models around the country, uh, not around the country, but around the globe um, that link repayment and even relief upon income. Uh, I saw one that works well in the UK where they link uh, repayment and relief uh, where borrowers repay only a fraction of their annual earnings above a certain threshold. Now, technically, we already have something like this here in the US, but government management of that has been a dumpster fire of ineptitude. NPR found recently that four and a half million borrowers eligible for forgiveness under the existing program, only 32 have actually gotten it. So another option would be to grant relief based on debt to income ratios. In that case, you're just marrying information from the credit bureaus with the IRS, and you are targeting a little bit more to those folks that need the help, are not wealthy and have the ability to repay already, and probably you'll get a greater return over the long term in making that small investment now. What, 
What about that, Michael Petrillo, debt to income ratios? Because, you know, folks might be going into Wall Street jobs, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have accumulated wealth. They might still be paying off mountains of uh, school and graduate school debt. Well, sure, but they're going to make that money back. I mean, that's what we have to remember is that education is still a very good investment, and most people get a lot of benefit from that investment. They will make millions of dollars more uh, over the course of their career than people that don't have that college degree. So the question is, why are we asking people without a college degree, you know, somebody who decided to go right into the workforce after high school, to pay for this kind of student loan forgiveness? You know, what if a, a, a guy went out and, you know, bought a truck so that he could get to his job? He's got debt on that truck. We're not offering to help him pay that off. Well, why is that? You know, why are we preferencing this kind of debt? Again, for people who are either now or eventually going to be among the most affluent people in our society. What about that, Horacio, Horacio uh, Mendez? Uh, folks that in, in trade jobs like that who might not have gone to college, is this kind of unfair to them? Yeah, that's, um, that's a tough call, and this goes into one of those categories where no good deed is going to go unpunished. Um, we know that there is a massive student debt crisis here in this country uh, to the tune of $1.5 trillion. It's quintupled in size since 2004, even surpassing credit card and auto debt. But it largely reflects increased borrowing by graduate students like lawyers and doctors who usually go on to be higher earners. There is a GDP impact at the end of the day. The Federal Reserve has done some research with regard to the limitation that some people have to purchase homes, and that has a trickle-down effect to everybody. Uh, but to the, to the point that's been discussed here a number of times, What's the highest and best use of public funds like this? Is this going to provide us a return that at the end of the day, while maybe some people feel it's unfair, is going to benefit the broader part of society? Or is this a bit of a giveaway where you have those kind of like an Oprah moment where 10000 for you, 10000 for you, 10000 for you? That's not going to fly as well. So being as thoughtful and targeted and making sure that funds like this, if something like this is going to happen, is targeted to those where we are going to benefit overall in the long term, that's going to be important. A lot to, a, a lot to think about, and certainly there's a political aspect uh, to this as well, as with many things. And our thanks to Michael Petrilli and Horacio Mendez. Thank you. Thank you. It's been three years since the city's last watchdog found gang databases used by Chicago police officers were, quote, deeply flawed. And still, no new system has yet to launch. WTDW News reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with more. Heather, remind us why the former IG found the gang database so problematic. Well, he said it was deeply flawed with inappropriate records that were was ripe for abuse and that it disproportionately targeted black and latino chicagoans who made up nearly 95,000 of the more than 135,000 chicagoans listed in the database he recommended that it be scrapped and on the day that this audit was released in april 2019 the police department agreed to do exactly that but the new system has yet to launch three years later. I remember doing stories a few years ago, people finding themselves on this list because of something that happened 30 or 40 years ago and they had no idea. So all kinds of problems. This new system is supposed to be called the Criminal Enterprise Information System. What else do we know about it and how it'll work? Well, we don't know much because even as the police department leaders have promised members of the city council that the system was on the verge of launching, there is no final policy that will govern how people are added to the database and how they can ask to be removed from it. Until that is clear, it's not clear when this database would launch, and that leaves the police department using these flawed databases to track gang members in the middle of a significant surge in crime. And, and at the same time, police officials keep telling city council members that it's just a matter of time before this news. This is going back years. I remember them going to city council and saying this. So what do we know about a time frame? Well, I asked Mayor Lori Lightfoot's office exactly that question. She referred questions to the Chicago Police Department, who said that they were working to vet data that will be moved from this old system to the new system, and that was taking longer than anticipated. Now, the city was sued over this gang database by people who said that they had suffered harm from the database, and so this new database will be governed by the settlement of that lawsuit. But exactly how it will work is 
still up in the air. So many questions still. All right, Heather, thanks very much. And we'll see you again later in the show for Spotlight Politics. Thank you. You bet. And be sure to read Heather's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. The fate of two downtown buildings is being debated by preservationists and the U.S. government. The 1913 Consumers Building on South State Street and its neighbor, the 1915 Century Building, were designed by two of Chicago's most storied architecture firms. But multiple federal agencies say the tower's locations just east of the Dirksen Federal Building render the country's largest federal courthouse vulnerable to attack and pose too much of a security risk to keep. Still, preservationists contend the buildings can be repurposed in a manner that preserves safety for the Dirksen and its employees. And joining us are former Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal in the Northern District of Illinois, Joyce, Jason Wadillo, and Lee Bay, architecture critic and member of the editorial board at the Chicago Sun-Times. Welcome both of you to Chicago tonight. Uh, Jason Wadillo, you were uh, U.S. Marshal when the decisions about this building were made. So what concerned you so much about letting these buildings stand? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Paris. Uh, I was at the top of the U.S. Marshal Service from 2018 to 2020 when uh, we made decisions to um, or we made recommendations, rather, that these buildings should come down uh, rather than be redeveloped. Um, the, the fact is, is that there are a variety of factors that we look at um, when we evaluate security risks to U.S. courthouses. Now, I'm not going to get into the specifics of what those are, but specific to these two buildings, we looked at their condition. Right, so the buildings have been vacant since about 2005, the better part now of 17 years. They have not been maintained. Uh, they are in disrepair. The facade continues to fall from the, from the building. Uh, we look at what it might take to rehabilitate buildings and cost is certainly a consideration. Uh, the estimates are that to rehabilitate these buildings, even if uh, the government's landlord, the General Services Administration, were to uh, fill them with federal workers, uh, we would be looking into the hundreds of millions of dollars. It would require a brick by brick repair of the facade. It would require a complete gutting of the interior of the buildings. Um, that money just simply is not available. We also look at what's known as the Interagency Security Committee Standards and Policies. Now, the Interagency Security Committee was created after the Oklahoma City bombing pursuant to an executive order by then President uh, Bill Clinton. And it brings together uh, 65 uh, federal agencies, uh, 21 primary agencies for which the U.S. Marshal Service sits uh, on, as well as 44 associate agencies. And th these committees evaluate security risks. We develop policies, uh, we set standards. And based on all of those factors that this committee um, puts together uh, yet another um, check in the box of not able to rehabilitate. Um, well, and, and I'm sorry, I got to get Lee Bay in here. So long story short, the, you believe that these buildings are dangerous because of the proximity to the Dirksen Federal Building. And let's say, uh, you know, a worst case scenario, a sniper is up uh, in one of those buildings. They have direct shot at what goes on in the Dirksen Federal Building. Lee Bay, given all these concerns, uh, why is it important that you believe that these buildings should be preserved? You know, the, the, the security concerns are legitimate, and the, the climate that we live in is legit to have con security concerns. I think the thing that puzzled us in a way was, one, um, uh, you know, the heavy lift to restore these buildings, uh, the GSA wouldn't have had to uh, take. I mean, there was a deal in place where the GSA would uh, tender the buildings over to the city, who would then turn over to a developer. They announced uh, this plan, I want to say, 2017 or 18, so if, so the federal government wouldn't have, wouldn't have had to pay and, for it. I mean, and Lee, it I, I'll let you. Can, I just want to jump in. Is the GSA is the uh, General Services Administration, so it's the agency that operates these government-owned buildings, like the buildings we're talking about. Uh, go exactly, ahead. and acts as 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 his, as his landlord and is his landlord. Um, the 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 other thing is that the the federal federal plaza, federal center, and and this is what what, what Mies Vander and the architect.
designed it to be what the, what the federal government wanted it to be. It's in the middle of a downtown. So there are buildings, you know, the uh, uh, Berghoff restaurant buildings abutted to the south side. There's streets that run through it and, and, and past it. So it was made to be, I mean, and the plaza is, is open and, and free. After 9-11, they put bollards around it. I was in the mayor's office, actually, at the time and worked a bit on this with, 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 the, with the federal government. But, but by and large, they, they pushed for openness. And so it was a mystery to, to me as architecture critic uh, why they would take this route uh, in, instead. And of course, with the city's help, the city withdrew its deal uh, after the security um, the, the security study was 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 completed. All right. Uh, so Jason Waddell, yeah, a few years ago, as Lee Bay mentions, uh, the government did strike a deal with a private developer that was going to foot the bill to fix all these things. A. B, uh, the point that Lee brings up, that there are other buildings close to the Dirksen Federal Building, and the government has not deemed those a threat. Can you respond to those? Sure, cer certainly. Again, our objective is to mitigate threats. So in 2005, the federal government purchased that entire city block to include these two buildings. So the federal government owns these buildings. Um, you know, we were able to achieve based on the congressional intent to create that security buffer that would not have existed had we turned these buildings over to a private developer. Um, you know, these decisions were not made in a vacuum. We do believe that, you know, even with the uh, current environment where these buildings come down, it would promote the openness that the architect, the original architect of the Dirksen building uh, sought, and that is the openness. The fact is, is that the front, the true front of the Dirksen Courthouse faces State Street. Years ago, it was re-engineered so that people entered on the Dearborn side, but the true front is State Street. And when we eliminate these buildings, we could create, the federal government could create this openness that was a part of the architectural uh, design in developing the entire federal plaza. So we believe that there is a path forward um, you know, the cost that is associated with what it would take to rehabilitate these buildings, just not money that is available. I've heard from the preservationists, I've read a lot of what their ideas are. Unfortunately, um, from my perspective, I stand by the decisions that were made in the 2019 time period. And, and as I understand, right, the timeline is there going to be some hearings on this, but demolition is slated for 2024. Lee Bay, from a, a pr preservationist standpoint, uh, what is the loss to the city uh, from losing these buildings, uh, if you're a lover of architecture? Well, I think there's two ways to look at it. Uh, preservation and architecture, but also urban, urban planning, the, healthy, the health of State Street. Uh, so architecturally, to, to lose two 20th century, early 20th century skyscrapers designed by, some, by two of the kind of founding fathers of Chicago architecture is always a loss. To have it replaced with what was described to me by the General Services Administration uh, as, as a kind of like a, a, a plaza and security buffer takes away some of the vitality of State Street. We know from Block 37, which stayed empty for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, that uh, what that does to a street that was designed and made to have commerce and people and action. And when you put them, when you put these missing teeth in uh, here and there, uh, they're, 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 it, make, it makes it difficult for that to happen. Uh, walking by there at night, uh, uh, you know, becomes a little bit more difficult and challenging uh, just because it's not, not for any other reason necessarily, but, but, but that there is just a, it's just an empty space. And it's something that I think that State Street can ill afford. We talked earlier about people coming back to work and the efficacy and, and need for office buildings and space uh, post COVID. State Street is struggling with this, will struggle harder if there's a you know a vacant spot and it's really four buildings right uh two buildings plus two small buildings in the middle so we're talking about a big chunk of that street between jackson and adams on the east on the on the west side that would be gone all right well this is this is a debate that's going to go on and we will continue to follow this but for now our thanks to jason wadillo and lee bay thank you so much thank you and we're back with more right after this Certainly we can celebrate, but we also have to recognize what so many people have gone through because of racism and what people continue to go through. I think that Americans are finally beginning to embrace that we are African, we are indigenous, we are European, we are Asian, we are everything.
Illinois is ramping up efforts to diversify the labor movement. The State Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity this year awarded nearly $10 million in grants for pre-apprenticeship programs in construction, programs that put candidates in the pipeline to lifelong careers in the trades. One of the grant recipients was Chicago Women in Trades, a group that worked with the local carpenters union to organize a training program that is unique. For the first time, it's for women only. Our Amanda Vinicky visited this morning and has this report. It wasn't all that long ago that the biggest construction project Sheila Jones had taken on was putting together an IKEA closet for her daughter. <laughs> and that took a long, long time. And then looking back, I'm like, there's so many things I did wrong with it, which I'm now going to go back and fix. Forget IKEA. Jones is part of what the Chicago Women in Trades says is the regional union's first all woman training class in 140 years. Eight weeks into their nine week class, Jones and her peers have learned to erect scaffolds and how to maneuver aerial lifts. We've done wood framing, so like this, building, building up houses, building up walls, floor framing. Uh, we've done concrete form building, so building foundations, things like that. It's all part of a pre-apprenticeship program that will put Jones on the path to becoming a union card holding carpenter. At age 36, it's a huge career switch for Jones. I was actually working as a nursing home uh, case manager for chronically mentally ill patients, residents, and uh, that was during the height of COVID, and it just became too overwhelming. I have two kids at home, so when their schools closed, um, I just couldn't do anymore. It became just way too much. <laughs> She'd been making between forty and forty-five thousand dollars a year. As a journeyman, make that journey woman. She stands to make more, plus a pension and health care. Classmate Katie Maloney says she too took a circuitous route to get here, working as a camera operator and a realtor. I've had a ton of jobs. I worked at a restaurant at one point. I worked at a Toys R Us in New York City. It's been an adventure, but I've always really enjoyed being very hands-on and getting a chance to put things together and to really feel like there was a result to the work that I was doing. After soul searching, she nailed down what she wants to do, be a carpenter. Maloney says as a kid, she would build things with her grandpa and dad. With my mom and my grandmother, they wouldn't have had an opportunity to go into these types of fields, even if they were interested. So I know I've talked to my mom before and she said when she was in school, her choices were to be a secretary or to be a nurse. So she became a nurse. According to a 2020 report from the Illinois Department of Labor, there still aren't a lot of women in the trades. In 2020, women made up 4% of those in trade apprenticeship programs. Programs like this could change that. Unions are under pressure to do so from governments with minority contracting rules. The Obama Presidential Center promises 50% of its work will be done with minority women or veteran owned businesses and 50% of on site construction will be performed by Chicago residents. The training program's director says women have been carpenters for a long time. He trained with a woman in his pre apprenticeship class in 1974. There are women foremen and supervisors. Women were accepted. You know, you always have somebody that, you know, it has to make a comment, but mostly everybody has worked with uh, with everybody. You have to work with everybody. The way you build a building was with a group of people. That's the only way that construction works. To get into the program, would-be apprentices have to pass a math and aptitude test. No experience with a hammer and nail or circular saw necessary. They'll learn. We missed this morning's workout, but that is another element of training. Women have to carry two by four planks, 16 foot scaffolding, and do push ups every day because this is a physically demanding job. The instructor, a woman, by the way, says the class has discussed one downside their training doesn't mirror reality. Once they're full fledged carpenters, the trainees will work on crews made of mostly men as Christy Fell is doing right next door, where she is the only woman. I think there are stereotypes, especially with just, uh, you know, maybe women being weaker or unemotional or the general uh, substance. But when you break it down, everybody has a bad day. Everybody has their flaws and weaknesses. And that's the point of me being in this guy's class, kind of, is to point out that we can carry each other in different strengths and weaknesses. 
Fell says she'd enjoy what she called the sisterhood of traveling pants atmosphere of the all women's class across the wall, but she's also using her training as an opportunity to teach and to encourage the mostly younger men she's learning alongside. To have an impression on them of what it could be like working with a woman in the force, getting them comfortable with it, getting them ready for it, it makes it so it's more accepting that they're in with somebody different than them. Uh, you know, the uh, minority acceptance from the get-go. A concrete union certified foundation of acceptance, if you will. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Amanda Vinicky. Now it takes four years to become a journeyman or woman. Chicago Women in Trades is planning other all women courses and offers other programming as well. The inaugural class of all women will graduate from their pre-apprenticeship program at a special ceremony next Friday. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, why environmental advocates are pushing the Postal Service to make its delivery fleet electric and the obstacles that stand in the way. Too many things in our country have become highly politicized. An unprecedented leak shows the Supreme Court may be on the brink of overturning Roe v. Wade. We discuss the implications in Illinois on Spotlight Politics. And renovating a historic theater inside the Fine Arts Building, a home for artists for more than a century. But first, some more of today's top stories. The Civilian Office of Police Accountability says it's been temporarily barred from releasing body camera videos and other materials relating to a March incident that left two officers and another man injured. These are materials stemming from the non-fatal shooting of 28-year-old James Callion. He's charged with multiple felonies, including three counts of attempted first-degree murder. As part of its investigations, COPA typically publishes materials around individual incidents, but in a one-page order, a judge ordered the office not to release those materials, quote, during the pendency of criminal matter. The Cook County Sheriff's Office says they collected more than 1,400 pounds of pills for National Prescription Drug Take Back Day last month. The office held events that allowed residents to safely dispose of the medications. In addition to pill take back events, there are also 80 permanent collection sites as well as a mail back service. The old post office is getting a new food hall. The Chicago Tribune reports the food hall called From Here On will open in the South Loop this June. Chicago based hospitality group 16 Inches on Center is working on the new eatery. The group is also behind venues like the Empty Bottle and the Revival Food Hall. Roughly a dozen Chicago-based vendors will set up shop in this new space. Illinois, 15 other states and environmental advocates are suing the U.S. Postal Service over its plan to buy gasoline-powered trucks for its delivery fleet. Now, the lawsuits claim the Postal Service's environmental review had major flaws and are pushing the agency toward electric delivery trucks. Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg is here with more on the effort and why electrifying the fleet of mail trucks might not be easy. Nick, why not? Well, Paris, that federal lawsuit that Illinois joined last week and... Uh, uh, you know, as you mentioned, it charges the Postal Service with botching its review of a plan to buy as many as 165,000 new delivery trucks in an effort to modernize. Now, the contract calls for just 10 percent of those trucks to be electric vehicles, but the agency says it could buy more depending on whether it makes fiscal and strategic sense. But Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul says it appears the agency didn't follow the National Environmental Policy Act by awarding the contract before conducting an environmental review. These laws are not put on the books just so you can check a box and put out a report after you've made a decision. The Postal Service um, has a, a fleet of over 212,000 vehicles. And so if we can affect change with the Postal Service, that could have dramatic effect on, on our environment, on preserving our environment. And Nick, what's the response been like from the Postal Service? Well, so far the agency's been defending the deal. A spokesperson told us it placed an initial order for 50,000 trucks in March, and a minimum of about 10,000 of those will be electric vehicles. Quote, the Postal Service is fully committed to the inclusion of electric vehicles as a significant part of our delivery fleet, even though the investment will cost more than an internal combustion engine vehicle. That said, as we've stated repeatedly, we must make fiscally prudent decisions in the needed introduction of a new vehicle 
vehicle fleet. We will continue to look for opportunities to increase the electrification of our delivery fleet in a responsible manner. Now, in addition to the 16 states suing the Postal Service, environmental groups are also taking the agency to court. Patricio Portillo of the Natural Resources Defense Council says many of the trucks in the current fleet have been on the road for decades, meaning the new ones are likely to have a long life too. And he notes they spend a lot of time out on the road. These vehicles every day of the week, pretty much, they are in our neighborhoods, uh, idling, you know, driving slow, doing the hard work of delivering our mail, um, but they're also putting out uh, NOx and particulate matter into our air. Um, and this is a big issue, uh, particularly for communities that are already suffering from poor air quality. Yeah, Nick, we know a lot of communities in Chicago have poor air quality. Uh, what's uh, been reaction like from some of those communities? Well, local environmentalists that we spoke to have been supportive of this plan, especially since it's not just the Postal Service out on the road. The increase in e-commerce, in particular during the pandemic, means more delivery vehicles than ever. Now, advocates say electric vehicles can improve air quality, but they also caution it's important to pay attention to where distribution centers go and make sure that they aren't just in Chicago's lower income neighborhoods and communities of color. We understand that the city and state want to grow when it comes to transportation, logistics, and distribution. However, they are not considering the impacts both on air quality issues, but cost of medical and health um, to our communities and the environment, quite honestly, um, as part of that equation. Unfortunately, the dollar signs of that growing industry are, are too, too attractive to look at the realities of what comes along with that. And communities like ours and communities across Illinois are facing the detriment of uncontrolled growth in this area um, on a daily basis. Companies with big delivery footprints, including Amazon, have said they want to have electric vehicles make up a major portion of their fleets, but it's not necessarily that simple. There are still production capacity and supply chain challenges to going all electric. Casper Rawls is chief data officer for Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, a market analysis firm for the raw components that go into electric vehicles. Post-pandemic, we saw global governments uh, kind of looking to promote the green recovery, which is, you know, a large part of that is the energy transition. So the move from fossil fuels to renewable energy and electric vehicles in transport are a really key component of that. So cost is a big problem. So in the near term, you know, managing those costs is very hard. There's no effective hedging tool to, to kind of manage your cost exposure. Then in the medium term as well, we're looking at just a problem around sourcing generally, actually being able to access the materials you need at the time you need. But Rawls says commitments from the Biden administration to improve the supply chain are positive signs for the EV market. And the NRDC's Portillo told me since the new USPS vehicles will all be built by a single contractor, that can help ease the crunch too and make a fleet of electric postal trucks a reality. Paris? Right, we'll see where these uh, lawsuits go. Nick, thanks very much. Thank you. An unprecedented leak from the U.S. Supreme Court creates a political earthquake. Confusion over Chicago's casino plan and Mayor Lori Lightfoot tells mayoral challengers to bring it on, saying, quote, I fear no one. And here with all that and more in tonight's Spotlight Politics are Amanda Vinicky without the yellow hat on and Heather Sharon. Uh, let's hear some of the political reaction in Illinois from that landmark report last night on both sides of the aisle. We will never waver in our commitment to stand with women. But listen, on, on the Republican side, we expect to hear from every single candidate where they stand. Do they stand with women and our right to bodily autonomy or not? Until the legislature is solidly Republican, that until the governor's office is solidly Republican, that these, uh, these pro-choice measures will stay in place. And I do believe that through time, we'll be able to chip away at the uh, at the radical abortion legislation that has been passed in the last two years and i think people throughout the throughout the state of illinois understand and agree with that a man of midterm a little over a month away how does this change the political dynamic well, so it really is going to be a big deal, I think, in the primary, and the two sound bites that you just heard really encapsulate that. Republicans are, for them, it is sort of, um, it, it depends on where you're at. But for conservatives who are running to the right, this is 
amazing for them. They say it is going to galvanize that face. For folks, you look like somebody such as Richard Irvin, who are trying to win the primary, but then succeed in the general, because the conventional wisdom is that you have to be a more moderate Republican in order to do that in Illinois. Ooh, he is sweating. This puts him in very much a difficult position. Democrats, as you heard from the lieutenant governor right there, are going to do all that they can to exacerbate that and likewise to galvanize their base. This is sort of like I mean, this decision. It's like an earthquake. It hasn't come yet, but we've got the aftershock before the actual quake. This is how much it is shaking up politics going into that June 28th primary. Yeah, Heather Sharon, you saw Governor Pritzker jump on this right away. He went on national cable news right after that report in Politico came out. Uh, it, it had seemed that uh, Democrats were going to have a, a tough time here in these midterms with turnout galvanizing their base. Uh, does this change that? Well, Democrats are certainly hoping that it will. Um, you know, at the very beginning of Pritzker's time in office, he vowed to make Illinois the most friendly state for abortion rights and reproductive health for women. So this has been a central part of his efforts as governor dating to before this uh, almost earthquake, I guess we can call it, to pick up on Amanda's metaphor. So he, this is right in his wheelhouse. He is hoping to capitalize on this, but it is really anybody's guess as to whether or not this does get voters to the polls on June 28th. We've been talking about it's a weird time for a primary and everybody will scram be scrambling to get voters to the polls. And this might provide a little bit of impetus to do so for Democrats. I mean, so, you know, Heather, I, oh, sorry, Paris. I was just going to say, I mean, it is a weird election time, right? I mean, it, it's in the summer. As you noted, we, we've been talking about it. We, we can't make predictions. I do think that something like this is going, to, is so monumental for people who care about the issue for abortion. And by the way, that is a lot of women and that is a lot of crucial votes. Uh, and so if, if this doesn't galvanize, it is hard to imagine what will. In a way, you right. think of politics. I mean, there's a war going on, of course, in Ukraine. Inflation, crime, these don't go away. But this is the sort of thing that gets people on both sides of the issue very motivated. Hard, hard to think of a more galvanizing is issue. I'll throw this out to either of you on the public policy front. You know, we've, we've heard Congress talk about uh, passing a federal law codifying Roe v. Wade protections. We know that Illinois uh, has laws in the books that, that maintain uh, abortion being accessible and legal. But Heather Sharon, first of all, what's the prospect of a federal law and, and, and how does that interact with state laws like Mississippi and Texas that are going to outlaw abortion completely? Well, we heard State Representative Kelly Cassidy speak exactly to this yesterday, not only alongside Governor Pritzker, but later at Planned Parenthood in downtown Chicago. And she said that if the Democrats lose control of the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, and then a Republican president is elected in 2024, it, a national ban on abortion it is likely, she said. And then at that point, Illinois is no longer an oasis for women who need abortion or or other reproductive health services, because of course federal law would trump state law. So that is what Kelly Cassidy really wanted to warn people that that people have been sort of saying that not much is going to change in Illinois if Roe versus Wade is overturned because there are state laws that would protect a woman's right to choose, but that will not trump federal law. And Kelly Cassidy was very clear that that is what's on tap, uh, perhaps as soon as 2024. Right, and, and we and, clearly and also know where the U.S. Supreme Court would stand in that event as well with this expected. And, 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 and Justice Alito, in his opinion, had basically said that Roe v. Wade didn't take away all the controversy over this issue, but uh, this draft opinion, uh, should it stand, certainly doesn't take it away either, just, just makes it much more controversial and much more open-ended. Let's move on to the casino uh, proposals. Uh, Heather Sharon, there's some reports now saying that Mayor Lightfoot has uh, her horse, uh, her winning horse, uh, and that is the Bally's proposal on uh, Halstead in Chicago where the Tr Tribune printing plant is. Uh, is that square with what you're hearing? 
It, it is. Um, the, you know, I think that the definitive answer, which we could have as soon as tomorrow morning, really comes down to, the, to two things. One, the Bally's proposal would create the most money for the city and state. So that has been Mayor Lori Lightfoot's number one goal since this started, because this money will help the city pay down its massive pension debt for police and firefighters. The other issue is, is that this Bally's proposal is the only one th that the local alder person has not come out in vehement opposition of. This would go in Alderman Walter Burnett's 27th ward. Now, he is not thrilled about the prospect of a casino in River West on what is now the Chicago Tribune printing plant and newsroom, but he's not against it. And Walter Burnett, who has been in, in the city council for a long time, you know this as well as I do, Paris, he is the consummate um, you know, deal maker and connector. So if if this casino does go in his ward, he is going to try to get everything he can for his constituents. It is going to put him at odds with Alderman Brendan Riley and Alderman Brian Hopkins, two neighboring alder people who are very much against the proposal. So we still have a lot of uh, hands of cards to play in this game to right. make a there, bet. There, there, there are a lot of council members that have been thorns in the sides of mayors. Uh, Alderman Burnett has not been that we'll we'll see where he goes on this but Amanda Vinicky uh, Heather mentioned the other older people that are in close proximity there they're saying heck no to this how is this proposal if this is indeed the winner gonna get a majority support on City Council when when residents there have said we're, we're just we're just not cool with this uh, and mass they've said that uh, and an aldermanic prerogative is something that has been respected by colleagues for a long time Right, but aldermanic prerogative right there, you've got Burnett. So what you're hearing from uh, Riley and Hopkins is that they are going to do all they can to twist their arms of the rest of the members of the city council, play their cards, if you will, and perhaps the local constituents will be the ones who will be uh, help them in, uh, along those lines. If they really galvanize, as you noted, Paris, the associations, those who live nearby, are saying we don't want to deal with the disruption with the traffic all of the tumult that a casino could bring but this is going to go somewhere i mean it really is ironic think about how bad chicago wanted a casino how much the city had been fighting for this and now that it's been given the option nobody wants it <laughs> there haven't been really any elder people um, other than barnett who isn't jumping up and down about the prospect at least outwardly who want to bring it to their community heather sharon very quickly is it over for uh, the other proposals here rush street gaming neil bloom and, and then the hard rock proposal well, I am sure that they are all scrambling, trying to sort of stave this off and keep their bids alive because there is just so much money at stake that I don't think anyone is going to go quietly, especially when the, the prospects for any casino is so uncertain in the city council. All right. And so by the way, this does still need state gaming board approval. So right. even if it does get by the city council, there's another layer left and the gaming board, they take a really close look at these things. A lot of, a lot of hurdles left to go. A lot of hurdles if the city wants to host the 2024 Democratic National Convention like it did in 1996 uh, and 68 and, and back before that sometime in, in the FDR administration or the Truman administration. I can't keep it straight. But uh, Heather Sharon, typically the, the, uh, both uh, RNC, DNC choose swing states. Illinois is not that. So how serious a proposal is this? Well, it's a very serious proposal, and Chicago is really making the argument that Chicago itself is an argument for the Democratic Party because it has fully embraced Joe Biden's platform of, you know, a, a raise in the minimum wage, you know, expanded rights for um, Black and Latino residents, and, and a commitment to, to fighting climate change and support for gay rights. Now, that is a different argument than we have seen conventions sort of make in the past, putting the, the convention somewhere to showcase and to sort of, you know, spread the money around to voters who would cast those deciding ballots in the Electoral College. So we'll have to see if it's successful. Um, but I think they've probably got the journalist's vote because covering a convention in Chicago in the summer uh, would be uh, a lot of fun for, I think, everybody. <laughs> and, and having covered multiple conventions, it's tough to travel to those places and uh, and, you know, deal, deal with all that when you can just kind of sleep in your own bed and then go 
go cover the convention all day. Amanda Vinicky, do we know when Democrats will make a decision on this? Paris, not much sleeping, having covered those conventions. No they are sleeping very, at all. Very busy. So, um, but, it, you know, I, I actually am not sure when a timeline could come uh, if, in terms of a decision. The final bids do have to be in by the end of the month. So this is a launch. We've seen the video. The, the rest of the details of the bid from Chicago and the other communities have to be submitted by the end of this month, the 27th, I believe. And Chicago is up against some other really big cities, the ones that I've seen cited most often for whatever reason in national publications, not that this gives them a leg up, or um, Atlanta and Houston. By the way, swing state, Chicago, of course, certainly not in one in Chicago itself, very, very blue, but nearby a lot of swing states. And so that might be also part of, that is in fact part of the argument for bringing a convention here. The hardest part about those conventions is the hotel rooms sell out right away. So I remember, I think in Tampa and St. Pete, we were staying like an hour away and you're yeah, done that, working that at 2 a.m. You, you take a bus home, you're up again at 6 a.m. to go work, so that wouldn't be the case if it happened here. <laughs> Heather Sharon, uh, very quickly, 30 seconds left. Um, a political consultant said the last week that the person that's going to really give Mayor Lightfoot a challenge has not yet entered the race. Who could that be? Well, that is literally the $64,000 question. We heard um, from Alderman Rod Rod Roderick Sawyer last night in an event um, at the hideout saying that he was still considering a run for mayor. And I think that the field is wide, wide open. And thanks to that poll conducted by Rep Mike Quigley, who decided not to run, everybody seems to think that Mayor Lightfoot is vulnerable. So perhaps that will encourage others to take another look at the race and perhaps toss their hats in. And I know Bill Conway has really been there. trying to make a play. Who, who are you saying, Amanda? Bill Conway has really been trying oh, to make right. a play who, who as well, for, because you've got to remember, county state council attorney. people would be giving up their seats. Right, he'd run for state's attorney against uh, uh, Kim Fox in the, uh, right. in the uh, primary there. All right, that's where we'll have to leave it. Thank you, Amanda and Heather. And up next, renovations for a building that's been a long-time haven for artists. But first, we take a look at the weather. A landmark building in Chicago has historically been a home to the arts. It's the aptly named Fine Arts Building on South Michigan Avenue, and a theater inside the building is being renovated to its former glory. Producer Mark Vitale has another look at some of the finer points of the Fine Arts Building. It opened in 1885 as the Studebaker Building, a showroom and assembly plant for carriages. Thirteen years later, it was remodeled and repurposed as the Fine Arts Building. Frank Lloyd Wright had an office, Poetry Magazine was first published here, and early women's rights groups were welcome in this space. Through many changes in the last 125 years, the building remains dedicated to artists and free thinkers. These days, it's home to the Chicago Puppet Studio, a gallery of art glass, a bookstore, and both music teachers and makers of musical instruments. It is also the last place in Chicago that still employs elevator operators. I think the, the last four are right here in this building. Two during the day, two at night. It has a lot of ups and downs. Two theaters within the building are being renovated. We are uh, in the Studebaker Theater, which is a historic venue for uh, over 125 years. Uh, we are in the process of remodeling it and revitalizing it to reopen this spring. And we are updating all of the audio video infrastructure, um, making it a more production friendly and a more audience friendly venue. Over the years, the Studebaker Theater has presented Henry Fonda, Helen Hayes, Eartha Kitt, and many others to Chicago audiences. Murals on the ninth floor include tributes to theater and other artistic passions pursued in this building. 
It is the home of one of Chicago's original artist colonies. It's a 10-story building full of workshop spaces, offices, and studios of local artisans. Uh, we have everything from dance companies, orchestra companies, architects, music instrument makers. What's so cool and special about this moment with the Studebaker is creating a space for the live and performing arts to now re-exist in the building in the same way that the fine arts exist in the building right now. It's a really cool building to work in for sure. A few times a day we'll walk, go to the ninth floor and take the stairs down because we'll hear somebody practicing opera or the cello or the violin. And it really does have a calming effect on us throughout the rest of the day. I think everybody feels like that in the building. We have a wonderful community of tenants. You know, there's so many various artists and musicians that have been in here over the course of my life and our business's lifespan. We have had crazy and cool neighbors and lots of experiences with the public coming into the building. It has a lot of personality, a lot of quirks, and a lot of ghosts. And what it really, really, truly is about is a shared community experience. Bringing people together from all corners of the city and building bridges between communities, that's a thing that the arts do, that the live arts do, the performing arts, the fine arts do in a way that nothing else really can. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. And the renovation of the Studebaker Theater is now complete. This Saturday night, the Chicago Jazz Orchestra performs a tribute to Frank Sinatra and Count Basie with guest vocalist Paul Marinero. That sounds like an awesome show. And again, the Studebaker Theater is located within the Fine Arts Building at 410 South Michigan Avenue. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. The Federal Reserve issues its biggest interest rate hike in more than 20 years in an effort to tackle inflation. And it's home to the Chicago History Museum, Zany's Comedy Club, and more. We go live from Old Town on the city's north side. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great evening. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a proud sponsor of diversity, equity, and inclusion-focused free continuing legal education for lawyers throughout the region. In the spring of 2020, as the country goes into lockdown, outside, the garden is coming alive. As a wild...